It's that time again. Welcome, one and all, to the Visionary Dawn Show. Here are your hosts, Nick Huber and Daniel Meany. Joining them today is special guest, Tab Murphy. Anyway, yeah, I'm happy to talk about anything like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, honestly, speaking of that, so as someone who is like uh, college educated, been a veteran, have relatively smart parents, you know, there's a lot of the mainstream media stuff that hey, we just don't follow anymore. And so we'd miss basically, can we take 10 minutes and get like the full spiel for the writer's strike? Certainly. Um, you know, I mean, uh, this is my fourth strike in my career. So, you know, mm. I've been doing this now almost well, 40 years, I guess. Jeez. And I about gave myself a heart attack when I said that. <laughs> um, so, you know, and the business, when I first came into the business in the early 80s, it, it was a very specific model and you had a very clear path to success mm. within that model. And, and I'm talking about feature, live action, movie writing, which was what I was all about, which is why I came to Hollywood, which is my first love, uh, you know, going all the way back to when I was a kid, sitting in the theater with my parents, enamored by it, and it was what was on the screen. And I thought, I just got to be a part of that somehow. Um, so in the, in the early 80s, uh, we were still under the studio system. And there, there were, you know, six or seven studios that, basically produced all the movies that you would watch, uh, you know, throughout the 80s, ultimately in the 90s and into the early 2000s. And, uh, and in those days, um, the studios were making, you know, a dozen or two dozen movies a year. Mm. And they were developing 100 to 200 others within their system. And so there was... You know, I mean, it was always it's always tough to break into any facet of, of, of a, a business, especially the movie business. So well, I'm not saying it was easy, but once you got in and you got a foot in the door, there was a lot of potential work available. Whether you rewrote a script or you, you know, in the in the 80s, I mean, studios were very welcoming for, uh, you know, original material. Uh, so, you know, a lot of writers could go in and sell a pitch of an idea for a movie in the room. And uh, or you wrote a spec script and you could sell a spec script uh, back in those days. If it was a fun idea in the 80s, I, one of the first scripts. Well, the very first script that I wrote that I sold was a, a teen vampire comedy. You know, so it was just a fun time for me as a young writer to be in, in, in the mix on a lot of, you know, cool projects and, you know, you get a few, you lose a lot, but you sort of work your way. So my point is there was a clear path to working your way towards being what in those days were considered like an A-list writer where you were writing big movies for big stars. And, and uh, that was sort of the pinnacle of, of what would be considered success in those days. And there were a lot of great writers that wrote a lot of your favorite movies from the 80s and the 90s and that were part of that. And uh, I worked fairly constantly uh, through the 80s uh, on several movies that never got made. But then one did. And then I, you know, got a break. Uh, you know, what I consider sort of my big break was to be able to uh, uh, write on a movie called Gorillas in the Mist which mm. ended up getting a story credit on, which ended up getting me a, an Academy Award nomination, which vaulted me, vaulted me into uh, <laughs> a, just a different kind of stratosphere in those days mm. of like, instead of going into meetings and sitting around with a bunch of junior executives, you were actually going into meetings mm. with people in the room who could say yes or no. Like, and that's what you, uh, that's what every writer was hoping to do, get in rooms mm. where... You didn't have to, you know, climb the ladder of a company and pitch to every fuck, fucking person in that company, including the janitor, to finally get in the room. You know, okay. so, uh, so that was, yeah, that, and that was, you know, that just felt like, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do, and I'm climbing this ladder, and here we go. And so that whole system that I just described mm -hmm. 
is gone. That's a, that's a, that's that's just gone by the wayside. It is no longer you know sort of like that much work at studios these days. Uh, studios aren't making that many movies these days, and we've seen this evolution that is you know ultimately brought us to this point in time where streaming has come into the fold and studios now are really focused on tentpole movies uh, that they mm. can and you know what what's happened to studios and it was still that way a little bit when i broke in but there was much more risk taking there were there were much more movies being developed within the studio system that would you know fall under probably the indie category independent mm. category these days Yes, there were tent poles being developed and, and written and made, Spielberg's movies and Lucas's mm. movies, but there were many other movies that would come out and Our take chances. Yeah, there were I there was room for a lot of content and a lot of movies. Yeah. These just days, to just to keep our audience up to speed for the just so I'm clear, the tent pole movies you're speaking of, they're the ones they're they're the original IPs we build franchises off of. That's what gets you yes. all the toys, that's what sells all the t shirts, et cetera, Absolutely. for that. Uh whereas, Absolutely. you know, back in the eighties, as you were saying, it's basically, you know, we need original content. We don't care what it is. <laughs> well, you have to remember. You have to remember. Willing to take that uh, risk. They kind of lost yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Star Wars was original content. It's mm. hard to remember that because there's so many there's iterations of, of that universe now. And it, 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 it's almost like a, you know, a, a tiger feeding on its own tail and eating itself mm. up from the you know, outside in. And and that's in Indiana Jones again. You know, like mm. so many iterations of, of, of you know, there was a series, and so we forget that some of our our biggest you know uh, blockbusters, and you know, Mar Marvel of course had IP uh, in the form of comic books. But believe me, when I broke in the eighties, nobody paid fucking attention to Marvel at all. <laughs> nobody cared. And, uh, you know, it, I don't know. It, Some it, of us remember the spawn movie, man. Some of us remember that. But, I mean, actually DC had more of a, you know, uh, more energy behind its movies at Warner brothers at the time. I had an overall deal at Warner brothers following gorillas in the mist and, you know, they were making Batman and they were making, you know, but even then it wasn't like out of control, crazy fandom. It was, you know, Tim Burton's like, I want to make a Batman movie. Okay. Well, you know, there was no, so the real explosion, I mean, I guess you could say that was the tip of the iceberg, you know, and mm. to some degree because it was a big hit and it spawned sequels, etc. cetera. But uh, so you know, I've lived through those, the 80s, the 90s as a writer, uh, and I've had good years and I've had tough years, you know, and mm. the years are getting tougher because, and this is uh, getting back to your original question of why strike now? Why now? Mm. Um, I've lived, uh, you know, I've been in, I've gone through four strikes in my career. Uh, some were short lived and, you know, deals were made and we moved on. The two longest ones, uh, and I would, this is 2009, I think, and, mm -hmm. and 1987, the two longest strikes that, that, you know, one was 100 days, one was 153 days, I believe, the two longest strikes for writers always mm -hmm. came at a pivotal shift in the business of, of, of Hollywood. There was a, sh a, a shift in the direction of what was going to happen and there was unknowns and you know we we struck in 87 for bhs because mm -hmm. it, it was it was unknown how big that was going to be and what it was going to look like and uh in 2009 we you know like we struck for blu-ray and residuals and things that and and the history of hollywood is such that you know if you don't plant a flag and get in on the ground floor of certain things, whether mm -hmm. it's in this strike AI or streaming and how we figure out residuals for eyes on, you know, like a program, but how, where's the data for that? How do we, how do we monetize that uh, for writers to receive residuals? Because frankly, residuals are what get us through 
the lean times, you know. Yeah. And now residuals are shrinking, and that's why there's this outcry of middle class writers saying, "Fuck, I can't pay my rent. I'm mm -hmm. working on a hit show right now. They're only giving me four episodes. I'm done, and I can't pay my rent now. And I'm getting no residuals for that, or mm -hmm. very little. So I mean, it's like there's so many things. But anyway, I I think I wound myself up into a Sorry. Yeah, I went fun. down a rabbit hole and I've lost yeah. my train of thought a little bit. But uh, so our main focus, uh, I think you were getting at the um, pretty much so the how does the AI writing feature into the current well, strike? I mean, for it? We've seen why, bits and is, pieces yeah. about AI yeah. writing and whatnot. Well, and there's, a, there's a lot of stuff about AI, but AI <laughs> is not it is not something that is uh, crystallized yet, but it is on the horizon and it, and it is something writers are concerned about. Yeah. Just, just like VHS was, was something writers were concerned about how our movies are going to be now played on a, on, at home mm -hmm. and we should be able to participate in the profit of whatever the studios are making in yeah. some fashion. So again, what I was trying to allude to is that the longest and toughest strikes have always come when there's been a monumental shift and mm -hmm. even a, a shift that is on the horizon that hasn't quite happened yet mm -hmm. is headed our way. And so that's AI that is trying to figure out, you know, with our shrinking, uh, you know, sort of like residuals, yet the studios are making more money than they've ever made. And mm -hmm. despite their crying, <laughs> oh, we're poor. We're losing money it's, in streaming. Like, we're so poor. I yeah, can't really buy my say. second yacht. I can't yeah. buy another boat. <laughs> yeah. So there is a lot on the table. Mm. And in addition to just, uh, you know, the cost of living increases that normally we get during a strike, aren't even covering the cost of living that people are facing. And no. so, you know, it was clear very early on that the studios weren't interested in making a deal. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand the attitude because, you know, we're all fucking in this business together. We all need each other. Yeah. We need each other. And, and the amount of money that the WGA is asking for is, you know, really, it isn't, it, it's, it is so, it's Minimal. peanuts to what it it's could make. It's peanuts to what yeah. they make every year. So I don't understand why they put us through this. Why mm. they put us through this pain and suffering, and some people are going to lose their homes, and other people are, you know, freaking yeah. out, and this middle class is being squeezed, and and mm. I, and because ultimately they're going to settle, mm. just like they did in those other two long <laughs> strikes, they're going to settle, no. and you're going to look back and they're going to go, why did they inflict this suffering on us? Why did they inflict it on themselves mm. to the tune of I don't know, twenty billion, thirty four, whatever it is? Mm. They didn't have to do that. Yeah, they can just yeah. deal fairly and say, "Okay, we're making a lot of money. Let's let's slice up the pie a little more fairly for the writers. Let's take care yeah. of them, the directors, the actors." Now, so I don't get it. I don't get the mentality of like, "Let's dig in our heels and make them suffer, then we'll settle." <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. You I you always and you mentioned it like again in two thousand nine with the Blu rays coming out and VHS uh, with the previous fight being VHS and everything to it. Now this fight being in the streaming platform, because now it's not even, you know, you have to physically buy a copy that you would get a slice of. How do you slice up the subscription to Disney? Well, Plus? this is, this is part of the problem because yeah. the studios are not forthcoming with the, with the data mm. about how many people have watched, how yeah. many millions of people have watched their shows. They they're, they're being very tight fisted. They don't want us to know. Because then we'll scream even louder. We need a piece of that, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's only fair. I mean, that's the kind mm -hmm. of, those are the kinds mm -hmm. of things that get us through. Because, you know, and the other thing they're doing, and listen, I, I don't, I haven't worked in TV. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, certainly, I've done some animated TV. The, this strike, I would say 80% of it is focused on TV, new media, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of that stuff. And there's, you know, the, the model um, that was in place for uh, broadcast TV and then, and you know, other markets and, you know, uh, cable series was that, you know, you would get it. Somebody would sell a show and they put together a writer's room, you know, of <laughs> six to eight writers. And then those writers would be on that show through the, the length of a season. And those writers, uh, 
especially when their episodes were being, you know, shot, would mm -hmm. be invited onto set. And they would learn the ins and outs of being a showrunner. They would learn the ins and outs of, okay, this is, it, it was almost like they were, they, you know, these writers were being groomed to be showrunners. And this is where there's a big disconnect in the studio because they're shrinking writers' rooms, okay? They're paying only two or three writers to come in and break a bunch of stories for, and there's less episodes instead of 22. There's only 10, maybe. I think that's and how many leaving, the just good, yeah. But then they're leaving the showrunners to, de to deal with all the other writing that needs to occur. You know, just because you write a script and turn it in, that doesn't mean the writing process stops. You know, writers are needed on set when actors go, I, you know, or a director says, this a scene isn't working, I need to... I need to, to rewrite it so that this goes mm. or whatever. So Line that deliveries now off, has, angles are bad, something to yeah, it. Yeah, that's now resolved to a show. A single showrunner has to be on all these places and do all this work. Mm. They're getting burnout. And and also the deals that the studios are making are are minimum, yield minimum mm. now. now. I think, you know, three or four years ago, 32% of writers on sh successful shows were making guild minimum. Mm -hmm. That sorry, figure has gone up. What's that? What was the percentage you said? That About was thirty one percent were making thirty percent were making the minimum. Now fifty percent are making okay. the minimum. So we're seeing cuts all the way down the line. We're seeing people working on hit shows that have to take second jobs. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's panic time. It's yeah. <laughs> panic in the disco. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know it, it really is, and I think I'm not. Listen, you know, I'm a feature writer, live action mm. mainly, animation stuff. So a lot of that stuff, you know, and I'm all also, you know, frankly, I've been doing this for a long time, so I consider this somewhat of a legacy strike for me. Mm. I'm walking mm. the picket line for a lot of young writers coming up that are going to need to find a way to survive this business and. You know, when I broke in, I was very confident that if I did well and, 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 and climbed the ladder, that I'd be able to afford a house and maybe raise some kids, no. as I did. And the writers today are facing a, 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 a situation where they can't even afford to pay the rent mm. on their apartment. I mean, that's bullshit, man. Yeah. You know, yeah, and that's the, whole, that's the whole thing about, you know, the, the studios need, the companies need to share a little bit more, open up the purse strings, and also be willing to train a whole new generation of writers coming up to run their fucking shows. Yeah. I mean, they're not letting anybody on the set anymore. All that went away. And so hmm. you just, you know, like, and they're just cutting these rooms. So the first place a company looks to cut costs when, oh, we just lost 300 million in streaming this, you know, this quarter. What are we going to do? Where can we cut? Oh, let's squeeze the writers. Yeah, the let's quarter. just squeeze every last. Yeah, so that is an old story, dude. That has been happening. Ugh, the time yeah. talkies were invented, but uh, it's it's so it's a critical time. I suspect the strike is going to be long, and it's going to mm -hmm. be hard on everybody. And the thing that kills me is it doesn't have to be, man. Just no. we're all in this together. We mm -hmm. love this business together. Mm -hmm. Let's work together. Mm -hmm. You know. So anyway, by, you know, that's and by my rant. Wanting the <laughs> <laughs> no, I okay. appreciate it. I really appreciate it because again, like we, you hear tidbits. It's like, okay, the writers are on strike, and it's like, for us now, yeah, they're on strike for the same crap again. <laughs> it's well, like, yeah, uh, and yeah, no, no, it, more so know. the updated, more so the updated versions of it. How do they? How do you? How does your work that you have done, you know, maintain its worth? For you as the artist, especially, uh, yeah. not and like you said, you know them opening the purse strings because, it, as they might notice, you mentioned it, you know that they keep looking for tentpole stuff. They want just one idea that we can create twenty movies out of <laughs> instead of you know well, and, and that the originality you know, and heart exactly, and art that goes exactly. into it. <laughs> and and you know, like, listen, I know there's plenty. There's probably and, and I know that there are writers coming in. And their main goal is to get staffed on somebody else's show and, and be a writer and, you know, make some money and, you know, maybe be a working writer. But there are a percentage of us, myself included, I don't want to staff on somebody else's show and write a fucking episode somebody else created. 
I'm a creator, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would do it for a friend. If somebody called me up that I knew and said, hey, I'm in a bind. Come write an episode for my show. I really would, you know, okay, sure. And I've done that. But I, you know, that's not my path. My path mm -hmm. is like, I want to create stuff. I want to be a storyteller. I want to bring the ideas to the table that get developed. And, and mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of writers out there that feel that way. It, it, but there's no, like, avenue for them. It, mm -hmm. any longer you know like it was uh nobody's buying spec scripts anymore yeah none of this none of the companies rarely I'll, i won't say never yeah. i uh, was so, i was told recently uh, just sorry to interrupt uh no 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 go ahead know. No, I was just going to say, because, you know, speaking of the spec scripts, like I've even tried uh, my hand at them a couple of times when we're, you know, learning writing and everything uh, in college for it. But even then, my teachers were honest that like nowadays, unless they put out a call for it, there's almost no point. You know, yeah, they're not it, looking. You're basically cold. You know, you can't cold call. You can't cold pitch. You can't just walk in anymore. Uh, kind of like well, you said, is, you know. And this is part and parcel, you know, and when I broke in, there were still studio heads that were, mm -hmm. yeah, they were by then, even in the early 80s, they were mostly owned by companies, you know, bigger companies. But they were run, the studio every day, day to day, boots on the ground, you know, mm -hmm. running of a studio, they were still run by, you know, uh, heads of production that were kind of like open, uh, mavericks and rogues, and mm -hmm. they would take chances on movies, and they would... You know, they, it was an exciting time because if you did write a spec script, you know, I mean, there was a chance that, you know, it could get made. These yeah. days, I mean, nobody's writing spec scripts, except probably during the strike. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you know, that that market had kind of dried up, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting kind of uh, scary time, I think, yeah. for a lot of young writers coming in. Because, uh, you know, they're just looking around at the landscape and they're just going, holy shit, I, my dream was to write yeah. and be a writer in Hollywood on a, on a hit show. Or, and here I am, I'm that. I'm, you know, got my two episodes, but I'm still got to, you know, bag groceries at Trader Joe's on the weekend just to make ends meet. And that's, that's not cool, man. That's not cool. Everybody should be allowed to have a career that is able to advance and you're able to get paid in a way that just like any other career, you can yeah. afford a house, yeah. you can raise kids if you wanted, and, you know, like the American dream, and that's what the fucking companies have done. They've shortchanged the American dream mm. for a lot of writers, and, you know, that's just not cool, man. It's un-American. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Honestly, it is. <laughs> so, for all the writers who are striking, thank you guys from Future Generations. Uh, and I hope, I hope they cave sooner than later. Cause I do agree. Well, that would be, that would be so awesome. There is a point. You know, there that is would a be point. awesome. Well, it's here's the thing. Here's what, yeah. here's what could happen, Nick. Right now, the, the, the companies are negotiating with the directors. Now the directors historically have always, you know, in, in several strikes that we were on. In fact, the one, I think it was a strike in 2009. We were out 100 days. The director's, you know, contract came up and they went in and a week later or whatever it was, boom, they'd settled with the, the companies. And so the companies could come back to the writer. And that's why we settled, because we realized once the director settled, we were never going to get more than the director's got. So what makes mm -hmm. this interesting is that we're out now. We went out on strike. The directors are in negotiations right now, but they have shown nothing but support for the writers. So if the directors go out on strike mm. and the actors follow suit because their contract mm. is up on June 30th, too, then suddenly you've got a you've got companies like like holy shit, everybody's you know like, we, like oh, that was no one the, here. Everybody's that leaving. Would be the wake up call of the century, uh, and I I don't know if it'll happen. I don't know. The directors are they they want different things than writers, and then we our our union team uh, of leaders have already said, look, if the directors, you know, settle for, and and mm. and get a contract, that doesn't mean that we're gonna give up this time because we have different things that are concerning to us on the table so 
So we'll see. But it's uh, it, it's gonna it promises to be a long hot summer, gentlemen, on the picket line. That's all I can say. Yeah. Well, let's hope uh, it uh, hope it goes well. And yeah, well, it will happen. eventually. Eventually, it will settle. It's just a question of how much collateral damage is going to be done over the next, you know, two, three, four months before finally, you know, people come to their senses. You know. Yeah. Uh, and this whole thing about AI, just very quickly. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's in its infancy stages and it, you know, an AI written script sucks, especially like, like a comedy. They can't fucking tell jokes. I mean, AI is only good enough in terms of what you put into it, mm. right? AI is never going to think of an original idea and go, oh, I'm going to write this script. You know, that that's so, uh, but it could be a useful tool. And this is where the writers are saying, okay, we need to have some regulation, it, you know, going forward. It, you know, I, I made a post a couple of days ago or a week ago about what a deal could look like for a writer if AI was left and, and the studios were given free reign to use it. And the deal was, you know, like, a, you know, like a writer might get paid $5,000 for the idea in a, and all of the characters and all the scenes in a script. Hmm. And then... AI would write the first draft, which is usually the draft where write, most writers make a big chunk of money. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> the writer would then be hired at a much lower rate to do a rewrite of the AI script and bring it up to speed. So you see, there are yeah. scary scenarios in there. And uh, look, it's out on the horizon. And I get, I understand the, the studio saying, you know, no, we don't want to, you know, like, say we're never going to use ai that's a tool and it's technology and we need to figure out what that's going to look like i get that uh but right now it's not even on the table they won't even discuss it and i think it mm. calls for some sort of discussion about if this goes down we're going to find a way to use it possibly but you writers are going to be protected mm -hmm. you're going to be part of that process if an ai writes the script you're going to get money for that because if it's your idea, if it's your, you know, whatever. I mean, so yeah. like that's that's kind of what is going to be an interesting, uh, you know, uh, solution, uh, a temporary. Because you know, I mean, as AI becomes more useful, a tool to the studios, writers are fearful that they'll become less useful yeah. to the studio, and that that just can't happen. We can't allow that to happen. Or worse, we all end up just editors. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll exactly. all become editors, then. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awful. <laughs> screenwriters slash editors. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's my two and a half dollars <laughs> on the uh, writer strike. Awesome. Oh, gotcha. That's just sorry. I'm having technical difficulties with this. Thing. No, no, no all worries. Good. It's all good. Uh, so, let you know, uh, Daniel have been recording. Just letting you know. Yeah, no, no, I know. Yeah, I know. I mean, why we I, I just assumed you guys were going to just jump in and uh, I, that, yeah, uh, no. you didn't do an intro or anything. You'll do all that stuff later. So yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll so, yeah. That's actually what we've. Uh, we're very recently. Uh, I like. I'm actually still recording it. Uh, we have like kind of like a late night show style introduction that okay. we'll have that kind of rolls in uh, basically just, you know, some B roll mild jazz playing. It's like, welcome to the visionary Dawn podcast with your host, <laughs> Nick Huber. That guy, think, you know, and Daniel Meany <laughs> and his co-host Daniel Meany with special guest Tab Murphy. You know, how about that? Who the fuck is that? Why did we tune in tonight? It's like, you might know him from these things. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh wait, okay, I do know that guy. Uh, very good, very good, very cool, guys. Yeah, well, yeah, and we'll uh, we'll get to it from there. Um, honestly, just because I know we're uh, we're stretched for time, but the writer strike is important to me, honestly, and. Speaking as someone well, who, I think you know, really important agrees. to everybody. I think you're right. I, it should be mm. important to everybody. And I think it's finally, I mean, it, you know, the support. Listen, I mean, uh, you know, mm. quickly, all those those other two long strikes. I remember going to like town hall meetings for the Writers Guild. And it was a, you know, it was a bit of a fucking joke because there was half the membership was against the strike and half the membership was for. And I'd sit back and it'd be the writers would be yelling and screaming at each other across the town hall. And I'm like, Oh my God, there was no real unity. I mean, uh, 
So mm -hmm. what's different about this, 98 point whatever percent of the entire union voted to go on strike. That is unheard of. So, I mean, there's wild really man. a lot, and wow. there's a lot of support, you know, like directors are coming out, produce, uh, not producers, but uh, Teamsters are coming out, actors are coming out. I've been on the line with all three, uh, you know, in various forms. It's, I think everybody all the way down the line recognizes this as a, you know, plant a flag mm -hmm. now in the sand and say, we don't may not know exactly what it's going to look like going forward with regard to AI or whatever, but yeah. we need to be in on the ground floor of that because companies never look back and say, oh, now, yeah, we should give you all that back. No, they never – once they have something, they never give it up. So yeah. that's why this is a, such an important moment, I think, in, in time and, and, mm -hmm. and, and for everybody, uh, consumers and, and, and writers and creators alike. Um, uh, so we'll see. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. And I was about to say we have, uh, and it's again, something that, you know, unless you look for it half the time, you'll barely see it in passing. I mean, truckers have been striking. Teachers have been striking. It's like a global thing right now, almost, but in our country, especially, uh, we've noticed that it, we're sorry, billionaires, you have to loosen the purse strings. Yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> That's I mean, exactly. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really hard up for the hardships that'll entail for them. Flint, Michigan hasn't had clean water since 2003. Yeah, no, I, listen, I mean, it's <laughs> everywhere in, in, in many different yeah. shapes and forms. But the irony, of course, is that one of these, you know, you know, mm -hmm. CEOs of, I think, Warner Brothers, one of these companies made 237, you know, million dollars last year. And the Writers Guild package is what what they're asking for is like ninety one million, you know. So I mean, come on, you fucking idiots! You know? All of your writer, all of your writers for three of your overpaid producers. Yeah, boy. Anyway, so okay, what else do you guys want to talk? About? <laughs> we got we got a couple. Um, I guess I guess I'll go next with my question. Yeah, so go ahead, go I ahead, wanted Nick. to uh, ask you about when you worked on Tarzan. So. Yeah. When you got uh, when you got the position for that, uh, what what did you get influenced by when writing the script? I noticed like there's little pieces of the novel in there, but I was wondering if there was some extra stuff, maybe from your experiences in nature, you threw into it. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, you have to understand that every single Disney animated movie that I was fortunate enough to write came from some place inside of me came from either, you know, and in the case of Tarzan, I watched Johnny Weissmiller Tarzan movies when I was a kid, you know, and I loved them. And I loved this idea of, a, you know, like man in nature, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, making his way and having adventures. And a lot of my work, if you can look closely and you'll find thematically, a lot of my work has that that theme in it, which is man, uh, you know, in nature, against nature, you know, man and woman's relationship to nature. So when I was offered Tarzan, it was like a, a, a no brainer. I mean, it mm. was such a no brainer. And uh, it, you know, weirdly, you know, I had come off of Hunchback and Jeffrey Katzenberg was running animation in, in those days at uh, Disney. And he said, listen, uh, he called me up. He said, listen, I would really love you to do Tarzan. We're going to do Tarzan. But it, it, at the time, it, it was, uh, you know, he characterized it as, I, you know, it's, it's going to be a direct-to-DVD movie. I know that's not as sexy as, you know, what you did on Hunchback Big, but that's kind of, but I'd still love for you to do it. I think you'd be great. And, you know, and I, at that, mm. I thought, well, it'd be great. I mean, I love the character. I'd love to write that character, you know, mm. an opportunity to, you know, sort of like, delve into my childhood and things I care about all, all that sort of thing. So I, I, you know, I did, I think I remember, I think I did a treatment. I did a treatment for a, a story and a, a lot of it was based on the first book, Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs in terms mm -hmm. of like, I read that and I, mm -hmm. and I, I just, you know, I was influenced by that. I was influenced by, you know, the movies and, and everything. And then something weird happened. Uh, I turned the treatment in, and there was like silence. 
And that's not what you hope for when you turn treatment in, right? <laughs> you, you hope somebody goes, oh, this is great, man. Great start. We're good. We're excited, blah, blah, blah. Well, it was like silence for like a couple of weeks. And I'm like, holy shit, man. Um, well, then I get a call. And uh, it's Jeffrey. And he's saying, I know you're probably thinking, you know, like, what's going on? Here's what's going on. We're, we're, you know, we're trying to move it to feature animation because it's, the treatment's good, and we think this could be a big movie, not direct to DVD movie. Yeah, th thank God they did that. <laughs> well, yeah, and so say, when you get a call crazy. like that, you go, okay, take all the time you need. <laughs> because that impacted everything about how the movie was going to get made, what I was going to be paid ultimately to write the movie. All, it was just a whole different. Mm -hmm. So there was some political by behind the scenes that had to happen because the divisions are – all under the umbrella of Disney, but they're all very competitive within their for themselves. And and mm -hmm. Jeffrey wanted Tarzan for feature animation. So there was some machinations behind the scenes that had to take place for that to occur. Uh, it, it smoothly the transition mm -hmm. transition. And I and I think Kevin Lima was already on board. I don't know if Chris was yet, uh, but uh, but then then it all got worked out. And then suddenly we were at feature animation and it just was like, okay, we just, you know, it, we just stepped into a, a gold mine here in terms of not money wise, but in terms of the, the artist and the mm. talent you had available to yourselves mm. on a feature animation. And they, and, and Kevin had a vision for the movie or I think already, you know, like how he, you know, and so they were put the best, animators on yeah. so it was just like going from like downtown to uptown man and it was awesome <laughs> it was awesome that's so awesome. i now now aladdin uh, two to one <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so now weirdly um of all the four disney animated movies i wrote during that period tarzan hmm. is the one that i worked the least amount on I mean, I did many, don't get me wrong, I, you know, I worked on it probably a little over a year. I did many treatments. I did a couple of drafts of the script. Interestingly, in the first treatment and the first draft of the script I wrote, we were, you know, we were trying to stay faithful to the book. Um, mm -hmm. And so Tarzan left and he went to England and we, you know, I wrote all that stuff and and then you know we all looked at it and we and 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 smartly realized that the real story you know at least for the disney animated movie was the relationship tarzan had with the apes and ultimately you know jane and, and the others come to the island and affect that relationship uh but it you know disney spends many 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 uh weeks and months really trying to nail down the theme of what this movie is really about. It's very important to them. They have all these boxes they have to check off before they, you know, sort of move forward with the story. So, it, you know, and it was, I think it was pretty easy to figure out that this was a, you know, a story about, and that, you know, Phil wrote the songs too, you know, like one family, two worlds or whatever the fuck it was called. No. Sorry, <laughs> Phil, no, no disrespect intended, but it was really a story about a man uh, trying to figure out, which family he belonged to, where he belonged, you know, ultimately. And so that informed kind of the way the story started to unfold and some of the, you know, all of the other stuff that came along with it. But I had, I had a great time on it. I, I, you know, the, some, I, it was fun to, you know, like we took a lot of the characters from the book and then we made them our own kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I loved, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you get to write Tarzan fighting Sabor. That was such a great, you know, I just had a great time. But then, uh, and I had done uh, a couple of drafts of the script. And then Kirk and Gary, who had done Hunchback for him, um, were gearing up. They needed to find a movie because they wanted to keep their team together. Mm. And they wanted to keep everybody in place. And... Uh, so I kind of, uh, the, it, it, the timing turned out to be perfect for me to kind of step away from Tarzan and, and, and huddle with those guys and really work on what would ultimately become Atlantis, the Lost Empire. So 
you know, I did not spend, you know, two, two and a half years on Tarzan, you know, mm. the other writers were brought on and, you know, I laid out, uh, you know, structure, story, mm. characters, it, you know, I, all of those things were solid, but the, yeah. you know, the, the scene work, you know, di like dialogue moments, little bits and things, a lot of that stuff was done uh, at, after I left and, uh, but it was cool, man. You know, I, uh, and, and just, you know, uh, real you're... quick, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, when you get to work with really the best animators and storyboard artists and, and, and they're bringing ideas to the table too, the writing of all four of those movies, you know, it's not me sitting here, you know, in the time, like coming up with everything. It's a very collaborative process. You're drawing on inspiration from uh, other people's works, drawings, this. They're given a lot of freedom to invent, to create. Uh, as an example, you know, I had written, uh, in my draft, I'd written the moment when Jane goes into the jungle for the first time. She's kind of, and this little monkey comes uh, uh, hopping around and she sketches mm -hmm. him and she mm -hmm. thinks he's cute and all this stuff. And then finally she's like, shoot, shoot, go on, go on, go on. I, you know, like, and then she looks up and, you know, in the in the scene I wrote, she looks up and sees the mother glaring at her, and she's like, "Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, no, no, no." Like, <laughs> the the baby the baboon, monkey, yeah. yeah, little baby baboon goes up to her mother, and she backs out of the jungle, and that was the end of my scene. Mm. So, if you know what happens after that, that was the beginning of the scene for many of the artists. They thought, "Oh fuck, we're gonna make a big sequence out of this." And they did. And so when I went to Tarzan and I sat there and I saw that scene coming up and I, there's, yeah, there's the scene I wrote, but oh, wait, oh my God. Oh, wait, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, like you, you have all of this talent <laughs> taking that scene, that little moment and making a big sequence out of it that was so cool, so fun. And that's why I had so much fun writing those movies because I knew that no matter what I came up with, Chances are they were going to do it one better. Somebody was always going to have my back and make me look great, you know. Uh, and so yeah. it was. Uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. Twelve years I spent uh, in the Disney machine. Uh, just to just so we have something for a good end cap here, so we don't take up too much of your time beyond it. Um, as you just mentioned, you know, with that switch to Atlantis. What is just kind of like from a as a professional and person from a professional and personal standpoint, what is it like handing off your original idea to another group of writers and stuff? Uh, and, and well, it's a little it getting takes a little to see the it. end product, you know, <laughs> yeah. when it's all done pretty yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I mean, it was a if it was a bit of a surprise on Hunchback because I had been on that film as the only writer for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then one day I came into a story meeting, which was a, the usual thing, that, you know, and that was the other thing that was really cool for me in terms of, uh, you know, that I was invited in to, to story meetings with artists and, and, and you know, like, uh, and, and I was really a, a part of the process. I didn't feel like I, you know, I just dropped my pages off and go back and, to my cave and, you know, <laughs> like I, they, the they really... Yeah. Yeah, they, they really welcomed me into the process, and I appreciated that because I learned a lot, dude. I mean, you just, you know, and, uh, but I remember specifically coming in uh, for a story meeting that I thought was just going to be Kirk and Gary and Don and myself and maybe uh, the head of stories, mm -hmm. John said. Mm -hmm. No, John wasn't in that, but I can't remember who it was. But I came in, and there was, like, these uh, these three other people in there, four other people. I'm like, huh, oh, I wonder who these guys are. And they were writers, and I'm like, and there was this like moment where I was like, what the fuck are they doing here? You know, like I was really <laughs> protective and I let my ego kind of, you know, get into the hmm. situation a little bit. But ultimately, you know, it, it, it was great. I mean, I, they were awesome, great writers. And what happens when you get close to production on an animated movie? You don't just start at the beginning and animate all the way through to the end. Yeah. You start everywhere in that movie. Every sequence has animators on it. Every sequence is moving forward uh, through that process, and and many things come up in every sequence. Oh, like state, like we have a better idea here. We need a, the writer to come in and fashion this. So we, you know, 
one writer cannot be in 12 different places at once when that process really kicks in and gears up and gets going. So I didn't understand that, but I learned quickly that that's what they were there for to, to uh, you know, help the, the process along. And they were, they were awesome. And, and, uh, uh, Bob and Noni Zudiker were two writers that were on Hunchback. They followed me onto Tarzan. So when I left Tarzan and I knew that Bob and Noni were on Tarzan, I was like, oh, this is great. That's awesome. They're going to be, you know, because I'd already worked with them. They've got it handled. Yeah. 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 And they were respectful of what I'd done. And, uh, and, and they just, you know, they just built this big cathedral on top of this solid foundation that I had sort of laid for them, you know? So it was a lot of, you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, on Atlantis, I will be honest with you. Um, I loved Atlantis because I, you know, it was Kirk and Gary and Don and myself, and we'd already done Hunchback. So I really mm -hmm. felt like part of this little tight knit family group of, you know, creators. Mm -hmm. And we cooked up the story for Atlantis. We cooked up, you know, I went away and cooked up a lot of characters and I, I, you know, I, did a treatment that they loved and got the movie greenlit. And I was, you know, I wrote a first draft that was 142 pages long, which is unheard of <laughs> in uh, animation. And they were like, and we were all going, and then I did another rewrite and we were kind of, we were what I felt was like on, you know, tr I was just having so much fun. And then I got a call. I got a call from Don Hunt saying, Hey Tab, you know what? And I said, what, what's up? We got a meeting or something? He said, no, no, it's that time in the process. Hmm where we're bringing a few other writers on and uh, uh, and not only are we bringing a few other writers on but you know we we're, you're you're kind of done <laughs> so oof. that yeah that was tough man that was tough and i was i was pissed a little bit and i remember i think i faxed i don't know jeffrey or somebody i said what the fuck man i just gave my you know a year and a half of blood sweat and tears on this project i love it and i'm being taken off and i you know, I just don't understand that, you know, why I'm being taken off. Well, I found out later the reason I'm be, being taken off because he wanted me to go write Brother Bear. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, I know, right? So, but, you know, in, in the moment, you get, it's just like, oh, it's, it, it hurts. It hurts a little bit. So to answer your question, yeah, it hurts a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, uh I always moved on from every one of those films knowing that Disney was going to give it the A plus treatment. It was never something I was going to have to worry about. Like, God, I hope they don't fuck it up. You know, mm. they would never, mm. and they never did. And they, so I always, you know, was able to, you know, once my, I wrapped my head around it to move on with, yeah. with grace and, 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 and the security of knowing that, you know, I, you know, I knew how, Cool Atlantis was going to be. I just knew how great it was going to be. Mm. I was a little like uh, that I didn't get to, you know, follow that and through um, because that, you know, they move on and they make the movie over the course of, I think, in Atlantis, two years. And so you kind of are out away from the, and I did go visit those guys mm. and I, you know, I would check in and see how it's going and everything. And, uh, but you do feel like you're kind of, uh, you know, showing the door and then you're kind of on the outside looking in, you know. Let me back in. Let me <laughs> just back tap in. it on the glass. <laughs> Mouse, let me back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me in. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I, I remember going to the cast and crew screening of Atlantis, and it was everything I hoped it would be and more. And, you know, I saw a lot of my work up there, a lot of my characters up there. Mm. And, you know, you can't complain about that at the end of the day. You know, you just go, okay. Uh, and so, and then, you know, I had a great time on Brother Bear, too. So that was the... So that yeah, so there you know, I mean, the great thing about animation, unlike can be in live action, is everybody who works on that movie is, is collectively working towards making the best movie possible without ego, without they don't give a fuck whose idea it is. Let's just we're rallying around the flag to make this the best movie it can be. And once you sort of give up any kind of ego stake and who did what and what I did or anything, but you're just all working together. It is absolutely freeing and so much fun. And that's, I think, so when I say I was bummed that I got kicked off Atlantis and I didn't really get kicked off, 
it was because I missed that fun, that camaraderie, that but not because I thought, oh, my ideas are all going to be rewritten. It, it wasn't that they did you wrong by removing you no. from it. It was that you had been enjoying the project, the art itself. Well, that's it, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's I have so a much Christmas, fun. You know, opening a, your best Christmas toy and then, uh, you know, your mom taking and giving it to your brother for a while. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> What do you mean? You must share. You must share. (laughs) I I, I can hear Mickey Mouse now like, sorry, Tab, you got to share. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Anyway, uh, you know, in hindsight, it was all meant to be. I, you know, I had a great time Mm -hmm. on Brother Bear and, and uh, I, you know, I never had an inkling when I was writing those movies other than my own sort of like joy of, of being a participant in that process. I never had an inkling. I never kind of understood what they would all sort of represent to a new generation of kids coming. Up. You know, I mean, I, you know, you move on from projects and stuff and especially with Atlantis. I mean, I've told this story before, but I, you know, when it came out, it didn't, it was, it was kind of underwhelming in terms of the box office. It was up against Toy Story, you know, and, and, and so it was considered kind of well, the 2D kind of, and there were just so many reasons why I didn't find an audience. And I was so bummed out. And for years and years and years, I thought, oh, Tab, great. You know, I got single story uh, screenplay credit on that movie. That never happens on an animated film. Usually you're sharing credit with two or three other writers. So I got single credit. I was so proud of that film. And uh, and then I, I was like, oh, great. You know, you wrote the only Disney animated bomb. That's what you're going to be known for for the rest of your life. <laughs> you know, like, and I, of course, I was being a little overly dramatic about it, but uh, but it did not perform. They waited well, for right? Treasure Planet for that. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> no, it did not perform well. <laughs> so it was, it, you know, it was really cool, especially I mentioned mm. the pa- pandemic where, where I, you know, discovered what a fanatical kind of passionate fan base exists out there for the for this movie i had no fucking idea man none <laughs> none Weird, i would just thought i'd you know if i'd put it out of my mind i hadn't thought about uh atlantis in t- almost 20 years i i loved it but you move on and you just and i had no idea yeah uh, you know so it was a it was a real shock and a in a in a good way to yeah. find out that there was such a passionate fan base and most of those most of them saw it and wore out VHS tapes yep. uh, all through their childhood. <laughs> I and I would, you know, and I've been in touch. Yeah. You know, yeah, I've been in touch. With, <laughs> you know, I've been in touch with fans. You know, I and but you know, I I'm, I hear them say I, I watched that 20, 30 times. You know, as a, you know, growing up, and I love Prince. You know, and in my back of my mind, I'm like, where the fuck were you guys when we needed you at the opening day weekend at the theater? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, we were, I was there in 2001 we were at four. my local theater. I was not <laughs> the one in California, much as I wish I was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I joke. I joke about that. But oh, the yeah. truth of the matter is most of the fan base for Atlantis, uh, so, you know, many, many saw it in the theater, but a lot of them, saw it time and again, time and again growing up uh, at home on VHS, you know, home home video. So, uh, which is, again, you know, one of the reasons we struck in 87, you know, like to to get a piece of that, even though it may be disappointing at the box office, uh, you know, home video gave a lot of It's a cult following. It'll definitely make that money back. Well, it already, yeah, it has. And so, so yeah, that's... uh, that's the story. Of so I do have life. one question, and I'm sure yeah, Nick about, does as well for Atlantis. Since you brought yes, it about the lore. That's Actually, it. in fact, I brought the press kit for the movie. If you're you would, but you're you got to turn your background off. Hang on, I got, I got. I'll just I'll get rid of my background. All right, there yeah, it goes. Like I go. got it. So I got the press kit for the movie in my hand. Nice. Okay, right I see it. Yeah, and I don't know if I had I've ever a, seen it. Yeah, so we uh, had a uh, question about the lore uh, behind it. Uh, I about hope I can it. answer it. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So, did you want to go ahead and get this one, Daniel? You already busted out the. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and bust this one. So, where did the ins? Where did you get all the inspiration? Like, uh, maybe from historical elements uh, for the environment for Atlantis. 
like just like the the whole you know like the architecture their culture like we, we've, we've been wondering that for a while was there any valid, yeah i mean it's a collective that was a collective effort from every department and uh you know people would come in and pitch ideas about you know and i'd be there you know uh i you know as a writer i'm simply writing about a lost civilization I'm not writing the details of how the buildings look or if, yeah. what flora and fauna are there. You know, and in fact, I, uh, gosh, who was it? It was Kathy, I think. I don't, uh, I, 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 I'm, 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 it was a while ago. Name. We understand. <laughs> yeah. I'm blanking on her name, but she was awesome. And she came in one day hmm. and she pitched, you know, you've seen, uh, you've seen the, you know, when they first come to Atlantis and they look out and the, you know, the water drug off the sides and blue and the steam coming up from below. Mm. And mm. she came in and pitched this whole idea of how it looked and how it worked and how all this stuff, not necessarily the details of the uh, architecture and things like mm. that and, or the flying fish or any of that stuff that all came later. Uh, well, I, I had the flying fish in there, you know, we, we knew that Atlantis, we, that, that it, was a, it, it was a civilization that had advanced technology, but yeah. that, you know, down in the center of the earth, they had forgotten how to use it. Generations had come and gone and they'd forgotten how to, you know, it was all kind of mothball laying around. And that was a fun part of having Kita and Milo figure out how to make them fly and then using them as an armada to go after Rourke and all that stuff. But she came in and pitched this whole thing, and the directors looked at each other, and I was like, "Holy shit, that's amazing!" And they just said, "Okay, done." You know, there was no like, "Okay, let's talk about this. Let's do it. no." And so that's what I mean. Artists in the, in the it within that system were so encouraged to be, you know, just free their minds and bring shit in. And if it worked, there was no like, "Okay, let's work on it for a month and see where we are." They would just embrace it. And when you have a situation like your ideas could potentially just be embraced as part of the movie, you get the best out of people, man, because mm. you're not micromanaging them. You're not hammering them with, oh, can we do this? Can we tweak the, you know, like maybe could we see another version? Not like when mm. it makes sense, you just go with it. And uh, so that was very exciting. Um, and so the answer is it was all parsed out. Every department, you know, production design department, had great people in it that, uh, and they, that I think the Atlantis architecture was kind of an amalgam of Mayan uh, and uh, other civilizations that they, so that they created their own look for Atlantis. That's uh, why I recognize the swirls. Yeah, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah, I was like, it's the stonework yeah. on the, okay. Sorry, yeah. that was bugging no, me. No, no, but that's, that's, and, and so, but they were really great, and they had a lot of time to research, and they would, you know, come in with presentations, and the big stone heads, you know, were, uh, uh, you know, the stone giants that surrounded yeah. them were, a, somebody came in with, like, what if, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the stone heads on the uh, island uh, off the coast of South America, what the fuck are those? Yes. The uh, Eastern Island heads. Eastern. Yes. What if those Eastern Island heads had big bodies under them? And so, oh, yeah. And then we kind of, you know, like mm -hmm. that's the kind of shit that would go down in a meeting, man. And then yeah. they stand up and they, they clap, boom, their hands together and they create this dome of energy. And we're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it just, oh. you know, that's what was so fun and so exciting and so immediate in the room the creativity was immediate in mm. times and it was so exciting to be a part of that you know and uh you know i mean it's just it was awesome and, uh, so there you and go. i would say like honestly just hearing about that like again like for you know uh our audience members who are like you know i want to get into the writing room of course like that's the reason to get into the writing room uh you know and yeah you i mean is being uh, able to be in that environment oh yeah, yeah. well with other creators and everything and I'm not sure. I mean, you 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 hear horror stories from writers room, live action oh, writers room. But he, I was very spoiled. I was very spoiled because there was not a lot. There was no like you know like uh, oh here comes you know a, you know one of the executives down the hall. Now we have to worry and look busy everyone. 
<laughs> there was none of that micromanaging mm -hmm. from the top management. Yes, we would have to go in and pitch. Yes, yeah. we would do occasionally two or three weeks, four weeks. Updates. Ago, you'd have yeah. to go update Jeffrey and the, the executives, and they were all like, oh, cool. Or here's our notes. Here's some ideas. But nobody, you know, so it was, uh, it was very freeing and uh and exciting it was a very creatively exciting time and I, you know for me personally it was the best uh writing school i i could ever have gone through because as a writer you know where most movies would end in terms of the writing process disney would just keep be getting started so you turn in something you go oh fuck i love this is my best work and they go all right, good start. Let's get busy. Roll up our sleeves. I'm like, get busy. It's brilliant. <laughs> no, no. I don't need to tweak it. Come but, on. Yeah, no, but they that was and that taught me a lot about digging deep in terms of character, in terms mm. of, you know, like just really it so I look at that as a as a you know, my writing after the Disney experience, uh, you know, just got so much better from that experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and still to this day, I mean, you know, I, I enjoy the process, and I'm 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 better at it than I would have been without those Disney movies under my belt for sure. Gotcha. That's awesome. Okay. That's great. That's great. Did you oh, have thanks. a quick question, yeah. Nick? Or Oh, oh yeah, I just had a oh, one other thing I was going to say. So I uh, was going to let you know this. So you remember your monster you told me about from the Godzilla 98 sequel script you wrote? Yeah. Uh, Stinger? I'm, yeah. Okay. The reason I asked the description during the last podcast is because I'm making a figure of it for you. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yes, really. Yes. Holy shit, dude. What? Yeah, Do I have to really? pay for this? No, 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 free. <laughs> no, that's free. I'm man. kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you know, I would, I don't know what you're doing, and I think that's awesome. But, you know, the Mega Gearus, you know, stinging like whatever, like, I don't know, a dragonfly creature uh, uh, in the uh, Toho movie. Yeah. That's as close to as I've ever seen of what I was imagining, you know. So uh, hmm. anyway, hmm. I'll yeah. look forward to ha seeing what you what you come up with there. Nick. Yeah, I took your description. mentioned You mentioned about the murder hornets, and then I was yes. kind of thinking like, so yeah, I was thinking I about it, and I was like, so close to Mega Garrus, but not quite, you know, because like the description, like the way I got from it was like Mega Garrus is what you're looking for, and like the head, but you mentioned the murder the murder hornet kind of appearance yeah. to it, and I was like, well, you know. <laughs> Mega Gears is more like a dragonfly. So I was exactly. Like, no, I always thought this would. Yeah, I always thought it was more waspish. You know, so uh, that's cool, man. But definitely insectoid. Like that's really awesome. Cool. I look forward to it. Yeah, of course. Well, okay. uh, did I, honestly, I know we're already over our time here for you, man. Uh, did you have an outro or anything you wanted to do, Nick? Uh, just wanted to say, uh, thanks for being on, uh, Tab. It's great talking to you, of course. Thank you for making all of our childhoods with your writing. <laughs> well, I and 300 other <laughs> very talented people on every one of those movies. But, uh, no, thank you for having me, guys. It's been a yeah. blast. I, you know, it's, I, I really never get tired of talking about process because every time I talk about process, I also learn something new, too. So it's, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. And we do want to thank you for uh, the deep dive on the writer strike information. Like I said, we'll definitely be leading with yeah, that well, still and everything. See we, and then, let's uh, see where we all end up in working. three or four months. Hopefully, it won't take that long. I mean, hopefully, the, nice. hopefully they uh, they can look back and you know learn from history. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't hold that. my own breath, but yeah, that would, <laughs> we uh, can hope. Yeah, yeah, for it. So once again, oh, thank you, Tab. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. And uh, honestly, we'll have to get you back on here to talk about more of the um, nature influences that you. Oh yeah, uh, you know, I, I, well. I, I, I've I, seen a lot of interviews where you talk about like your experiences in the wilderness. Uh, yep. The gosh, was the Kangaroo Valley is the name of it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I just you know for it just, as well and. Yeah, um, no, I, we just got back from Missoula, which has a, you know, an international wildlife film festival, one of the most mm -hmm. prestigious ones, and we won in our category. I was so thrilled, man. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I'd be happy to talk more about that, and 
Anything else you guys want to talk about? Mm-hmm. Okay. We will. Get you okay, next cool. time, Nick. We'll definitely keep it. Thank we you so will. much uh, for joining us, man. We'll go ahead and we can. Yeah, just give me a you know, give me a heads up when you guys get it all cut together and are going to air it. Yes, yeah, sir. I'll, we'll, uh, I'll we'll force you know my Steve partner to sit time. through it. <laughs> I, I force her to sit through everyone. Oh my God, not again! You're going to talk about Atlantis again? Oh my God, I can't. <laughs> well, see, that's why we tried to save it for the end. We had no, I know. The yeah, the yeah, other good, stuff too. Yeah, now she'll be like sitting here. I didn't know that. Wow, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> Bam. Anyway. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay, guys. All I right, gotta man. Today's program is brought to you by Meanest Media. And Sakura Central. Check out their websites below.